the Gilda's maximum lawyers community of legal entrepreneurs who are taking their businesses and lives to the next level. As a Guild member, you'll build relationships, be held accountable, and learn strategies specifically designed to get you unstuck and accelerate your plan for growth. Members are also granted exclusive access to masterminds hosted around the country. Our next event is coming up, and we're heading to Scottsdale, Arizona. There's something truly magical about the power of these in-person connections where real-time breakthroughs happen. Picture this. You're surrounded by like-minded law firm owners tackling your business and mindset challenges together. The energy is electric, the insights are transformative, and the results are game-changing. Investing in yourself is the best decision you'll ever make. The knowledge, strategies, and breakthroughs you'll gain are priceless assets that will supercharge your practice and propel you forward. Join the Guild and secure your ticket to Scottsdale at the best possible price by visiting maxlawevents.com. Run your law firm the right way. way. This is the Maximum Lawyer Podcast. Maximum Lawyer Podcast. Your hosts, Jim Hacking and Tyson Mutrix. Let's partner up and maximize your firm. Welcome to the show. Welcome back to the Maximum Lawyer Podcast. I'm Jim Hacking. And I'm Tyson Mutrix. What's up, Jimmy? Oh, Tyson, I'm sitting on the eastern shore of Lake Michigan. I'm looking out at the water. The water's been beautiful and warm. Lucky for me, because sometimes Lake Michigan's really cold. We've had a great vacation so far. Very nice. I'm excited for you. We we are talking about going to Michigan ourselves. So Michigan always seems like... I, I've never... I mean, I've been to Michigan, but not like for something like you're doing. So uh, it, it seems like a very beautiful place to visit. Yeah. And the best part is you're on the water in seven hours. So it's really terrific. That's pretty cool. I mean, especially from St. Louis, that's, that's a pretty quick trip. All right. Well, do you want to introduce our guest? Yeah, sure thing. So our guest today is Selma Benkabu. She's a lawyer from Tampa, Florida. She's licensed in multiple States. She did very, very well in law school. She's had a show on uh, Sirius XM for a while. She's been licensed since, since 2013. She's licensed in North Carolina, New Jersey, and Florida. Selma, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you. So Selma, tell us about your journey. Sure. Um, where would you like for me to start? Would you like for me to start after law school or? You, you start to where, where, where you think it is relevant because some, sometimes people start like Neil, uh, Neil Goldstein started whenever he was a kid. Some people want to start when they're an adult. You start wherever you, wherever you think it's relevant to, the, to your story. Sure. Um, so I guess I'll start in the beginning of my entrepreneurship journey into owning my own practice. So essentially, I wanted to practice in a way that was different than what the traditional law firms offer. I wanted to you know, have the freedom to be able to practice and take on the cases that I really cared about and, and genuinely make a difference with my license. So realizing that working for someone else wasn't going to be the, you know, the best way that I'm able to do that and be able to utilize my skills because I'm always at the mercy of you know, partner or someone else letting, telling me what I needed to do. Um, so in embarking on that journey, I wasn't even sure where I wanted to practice. I didn't like the idea of being stuck in one state. And so that's, you know, why I have three licenses is because I wanted the option to practice wherever I wanted to do so. And um, North Carolina license uh, has reciprocity with 23 other states. And so I felt like that was the best, the best choice to, to do. And so essentially starting my practice was a lot of, you know, bumping my head all around. There was this idea of, you know, you have to sound like a lawyer, look like a lawyer, and, you know, otherwise no one was going to take you serious, especially as a woman and, and a woman of color. So I tried some of the marketing strategies that, you know, marketing firms offer to law firms, and it just wasn't a good fit for me. It didn't feel right. I felt like I wasn't you know, being myself and it didn't really feel authentic. And to be quite honest with you, it didn't even work. So I decided to say, you know what, the heck with it. I'm just going to try being myself and see if, you know, if that works. And essentially that's kind of how my practice took off in in sense of, you know, just being who I am and introducing the world to my, my spirit, my, my heart. And, you know, it started building from there. That's great. That's great, Selma. So one of the things Tyson and I have been talking about wanting to ask our guests and maybe even sort of at the beginning of the interview is, why do you do what you do? What is your why? That's a, that's a great question. And that is honestly the most important thing to have when you're in, 
in this journey or, you know, at least practicing law. My why is really essentially to help people who don't necessarily have the mentorship that a lot of others are privy to. I enjoy protecting the livelihoods of other people. I enjoy being a part of the process of an idea. I call it, you know, creative greatness. It is such an honor and privilege to be around innovative people and to work with entrepreneurs who are like-minded. And it really does provide a sense of, you know, gratitude and, and, and privilege when you are assisting others, protecting their creative greatness. So Salma, I mean, how did you come to that? Because a lot of people, I mean, we see one of the biggest struggles is people coming to their why and actually really defining it. And it sounds like you, you nailed it right, right whenever Jim asked you, you didn't struggle, you knew. So how did you come to that? Honestly, it was really nine months of searching because I thought the conventional way of, of practicing law just did not appeal to me. And honestly, while in law school, I didn't anticipate feeling that way. It got to a point where I didn't even want to practice law. And what I realized is that it's not that I don't want to practice. It's just that I want to make sure that I'm on the positive side of things and I'm actually you know, helping people in the right way. It wasn't necessarily you know, working for uh, big corporations and you know, th- there's no individual behind the business. It's, you know, big corporate law didn't really interest me, didn't feel like it was driving me. So I really did a lot of soul searching and dug within and I said, what's really important to me? And, you know, how does, you know, God want me to utilize my skill and in what way? Where am I needed? You know? Sure. That's awesome. And so how did that translate into a practice area or a a law firm setup? So essentially realizing that there was a need for the entrepreneurship community, specifically in the startup phase, you know, a lot of people don't have the mentorship to understand the importance of having a legal foundation. So I started educating and and really it just, you know, started off because I started to see a lot of mistakes come across my desk that were definitely avoidable. And so I started to just host uh, workshops anywhere that they would have me. So, you know, that's essentially where it began. And the more and more I did it, the more and more I realized like, wow, people just really, there's a need for this, you know? And so that's kind of how it started. So I I find it interesting that in the questionnaire that you filled out for us, you talk about how um, marketing used to be sort of a weak point for you. and, And now it's one of your strong points. Can you talk about how how that happened, how that transition occurred? Yeah. So marketing, I used to think that marketing was like a dirty word. I used to think it was just having like sales breath. So I didn't really know the difference, you know, between marketing and and sales. And so essentially, and, you know, part of what I do when you provide a service, people need to know who you are and they need to kind of identify with you personally, right? Especially in a position of of trust and such an intimate relationship, such as that of an attorney-client relationship. And what I realized is as I got out there and started to talk to people, I didn't necessarily have to to be anything or say anything other than just really being true to myself and the right people will come and the right people will introduce themselves and, you know, they'll introduce you to others and it'll just kind of organically grow from there. I felt that marketing, um, at least the traditional way of how I understood it was, you know, you're kind of creating an image or a persona or something that's not necessarily true. And that was very uncomfortable for me. So I avoided it. And so I just said, I I don't know how to be something I'm not. So I don't know how to, you know, essentially convey a message that's just not authentic, authentic to myself. And that's kind of why it was such a weak point for me. And then until I decided to just be myself. And when that started working, then I started kind of enhancing my skills in marketing and, and really just having the the EQ to understand what do the clients that I want to serve, what do they need? right? And then what kind of education could I provide for them? And what are their pain points? And then I started to focus more on if I'm an entrepreneur that has no idea what's, you know, anything about the law or what are the legal implications of starting my business or running it or even scaling it, what do I need to know from that perspective? And so then I started to think in, in the sense of, you know, if I'm in their shoes, what, what do I need to know? And an education is really the greatest marketing tool because nowadays people are very the consumer is a lot more sophisticated than they used to be. I loved your whole answer, but I want to focus on two letters that you mentioned, and that is EQ. What is EQ? Can you explain it to our listeners and tell us how you think most lawyers get EQ wrong? 
So EQ is emotional intelligence, and it really just comes down to the ability to empathize and understand another person, right? And be able to anticipate essentially their emotions and, you know, how they're going to make a decision based off of their personality and, and essentially how the connection that you may have with them. I think that a lot of lawyers get it wrong because they lack empathy. If you want me to be completely honest with you, a lot of people in our profession are ego driven. And I think that that's the most dangerous, you know, characteristic that you can have as an attorney uh, because you're not really acting in the best interest of your client anymore. You're really acting in your own best interest to your detriment. So when you focus on the client as the, the goal, right, and their best interest, which is what we're supposed to do anyway, then in that sense, you're able to better serve them and you're able to come to better solutions. And you find that clients are happy. I mean, lawyers will probably make a lot less money, but at the end of the day, if you're in it for the service, then, you know, you feel, I get more fulfillment that way than I do making a dollar, you know? Actually, I, let, me, let me follow up on that real quick. I think that you're actually onto something, but I, I also don't think that it's, you know, live, live, connect with your clients on an emotional level and make less money. Or I actually think that when you connect with your clients on that emotional level, it's actually going to help you to make more money to be more successful. I agree with you for the long haul. Um, what I mean by that is in the short term, you might make less, but for the long haul, you'll definitely make a lot more just off of the goodwill that you build and that relationship that you build with that, with that client. Got it. So Salma, I'm going to take a radical shift in, in where we're going to head with this. And I want to talk about Instagram because Instagram is, is just not my jam, but you have nailed it. So talk about how you were able to build Instagram into a marketing force for you. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, each social media platform has its own language and you have to use its own copy that's going to resonate with that audience that, you know, that uses it, right? So Instagram is definitely a platform that a lot of millennials use. And what I realized within my own experiences when I'm looking for a service provider, for example, when I was looking for a dentist, I definitely used hashtags as a form of, you know, narrowing down the type of dentist I would want it to hire, right? Or whose services I wanted to, to retain. And then it, it hit me and I said, well, if this is how I search for medical providers, right? To see what kind of work that they've done, you know, what kind of personality do they have? Do they, you know, are they innovative or are they just kind of stuck in the old ways of doing things? Then I realized, and I think it's the same for lawyers as well. And so I started to essentially just be myself and and appeal to the millennial business owner or entrepreneur who's utilizing Instagram to sell their products or services. And that way, when they're connected to me or when they search, you know, using certain hashtags, they'll see whether or not I'm the right fit for them based off of how I carry myself and who I am as a person. So I think that, you know, Instagram is, is a great tool for lawyers to use so long as they understand the audience that they're marketing to and they actually speak that language of that particular audience. And how do you come up with your content for Instagram? I think a lot of lawyers wonder, well, what does what a visual medium like Instagram have to do with being a lawyer? So honestly, the content just is from your heart, right? Because I think that nowadays you have to be able to speak to their pain points. So even in the way that I educate, I educate from a purpose of what does a business owner need to know in their terms, right? So if I speak in terms of, you know, because I practice business law and intellectual property, I'm going to speak about disputes that could possibly arise utilizing, you know, social media platforms, marketing platforms, you know, speaking about the importance of protecting your business and why you have to educate people. You can't just throw information at them because, you know, if you're just giving them legal tips, which is what a marketing firm had originally told me when I first started out, you're basically reminding them of everything that they're doing wrong and you're going to turn them off. And that's exactly what happened. People started to unfollow and it was not working. So in providing the information, you have to put it in a way that it actually resonates with them and to their story and something that they can relate to. And if you can't do that, you're going to miss the point, you know? So Salma, you have a system that looks like that helps you. It looks like you're big on systems anyways, but you have a system that helps you communicate regularly with clients and more often um, than most other firms. Can you talk a little bit about that? In terms of uh, on social media or what do you mean specifically? Yeah, just how, how do you communicate with your clients? I mean, how, what, what differentiates you from, from other firms? Sure. So we're very accessible. We allow for Zoom calls, phone calls way before the pandemic. The way I started my practice is essentially for the busy entrepreneur. 
and also via text messages. Obviously, we don't allow substantive matters to be sent via text messages, but it's a lot easier for us to communicate that we have something important for you to, you know, to, to review in our client portal or if we're missing a certain document, the, you know, using text messages, it's a lot easier and we find a, lot, a better response doing it that way. I think oftentimes now people prefer that you just send them a text message or, you know, you're able to hop on a Zoom call if need be. And really, I designed my practice to serve my ideal client. We're talking with Selma Benkabu. Selma, what is your favorite thing about practicing law and what bums you out about practicing law? My favorite thing about practicing law is the impact that, you know, that I'm able to have on my clients and assisting them and, and the gratitude that they have for the services that I provide. What I hate about practicing law, I hate to say it, is really dealing with um, opposing counsel. I think that a lot of times we make this job a lot harder than what it needs to be if we just you know, put our focus on doing the best that we can for our clients and not taking things personal, we can definitely make this the practice of law a lot more fun and you know, kind of you know, just, uh, erring on the side of doing the right thing. It doesn't have to be a lot more difficult than what it needs to be in dealing with you know, managing client emotions and then also now you're managing opposing counsel emotions and figuring out a strategy based off of that. All right. So Jimmy, I'm going to do our first live read. This is the first one we have ever done. And so I'm excited to do it. You normally do it. I'm going to, I'm going to channel my best Tony Kornheiser. Hopefully Christopher Nicolason will appreciate this, but thanks to our sponsor, Smith AI. Smith AI is a superior receptionist service for law firms trusted by many maximum lawyers, including our very own Jim Hacking. At his immigration practice, the Hacking Law Practice, Smith AI's friendly U.S.-based receptionists respond to potential clients in English or Spanish screen and schedule new leads, and even take payment for, for his consult. The best part is that they don't just handle these conversations via phone. They also have live agents and chatbots capturing leads on his website through their chat widget. They serve as his friendly gatekeepers while his team and Jim work uninterrupted. We get new, or he gets new clients and we get work done. How awesome is that? So just so everyone knows, I'm reading, this is copy for Jim. I'm actually having to convert it as I'm talking. That's what's great about a live read. Um, if you're in a solo or small firm, I know you'll appreciate this. Smith AI now offers 24 seven virtual receptionist service, answering calls, website chats, text, and Facebook messages. That's something that's actually fairly recent. They've added that over the last few months. That's a big differentiator for them. Plans start at just $70 a month for calls and $100 a month for chats. They even offer a totally free chat bot, so there's no excuse. Try Smith AI today and see for yourself why attorneys like Jim say Smith AI receptionists are the secret to business growth. Smith AI offers a free trial, and Maximum Lawyer listeners get an extra $100 discount with promo code MAXLAW100. That's M-A-X-L-A-W-1-0-0. Sign up and learn more at smithai.com. Trust me, when Jim says, don't let another day go by, try Smith AI. That is a corny tagline. Hashtag um, nailed it. Hashtag professional pitch man. That's funny. That's good. I, I like doing the library. It allows us to add a little bit more flavor to it. So let me get to uh, another question. I, I like to ask this of, of a lot of our guests. I don't ask it to everyone, but Salma, I mean, you, I especially like to ask it of people that really just have it nailed, it seems like you, you really are just squared away. But what is it that you struggle with the most? To be honest with you, it's balance. And that's something that has been, you know, on my priority list this year. As you scale practice, you know, lawyers specifically, we have the you know, the heightened burden of practicing law, which is difficult on, on of its own, and also managing a business. You know, it's not like we're selling a product. You know, we actually have to work really hard and also deal with the downfalls of, you know, the business side of things or the up and down of the business side of things. So this year I've, you know, been essentially trying to find that balance between my personal life and also scaling my business. Um, and it's been quite a struggle. I can't, I can't lie. Tell us about your team and your setup. And what, what do you spend most of your time doing, Selma? 
Yeah, so um, right now I have two full-time employees. Um, they're uh, assistants. Uh, one is a legal assistant. The other one is an admin assistant. I also have uh, contract attorneys that I use for the overflow of work. And so essentially all of us can work remotely or we can work in the office. It was really nice being able to just pick up a computer and provide that to, to my employees and they're able to work from home. And we picked up like we couldn't, we didn't even skip a beat. We couldn't even tell that we weren't around each other, to be honest. Honest. So that was great. Uh, essentially, it's it's very fluid. Um, we work as a team and it's somewhat of like an assembly line. So each person relies on the next person to get their their work done. And, you know, we're essentially working as, as a team and I like to call them my family. So how do you manage your team whenever it's all remote? I mean, it's something that we do, but it's, I think it's something that a lot of people struggle with. So do you have any tips for helping people manage a remote team? Yeah, absolutely. So the main thing is to set the expectations and to have a daily to-do list. So we use a, a digital platform where we all have a daily to-do list. On that to-do list, we're all able to see what was completed. And I require everyone to leave a comment on, you know, if you made a phone call, I need to know what that phone call was about. And did you essentially accomplish the goal or the task? And, you know, we're able to kind of work off of each other in that perspective. And that also limits the amount of time I need to call and figure out a status update. You know, the checklist is there, the comments are there. Um, and so we're able to, to see where everyone is at at any given, at any given moment of the day. Uh, in the be beginning of the week, we also have our meetings where we discuss our priorities for the week and our big projects that have to be completed. And throughout the week, we check in with each other to make sure that things are being completed. And if there's any hiccups, you know, we're there to, to support one another. I'm not too, you know, far removed to do any kind of work, no matter what level it's at. So if I need to step in and um, support anyone at any given moment, I'm happy to do that. Um, and then we also utilize, you know, Teams, which is a Microsoft app that we're able to communicate with one another as a chat box uh, throughout the day and able to see, it, you know, where we're at at any given moment if we needed to. As far as our phone systems, we use uh, a virtual um, online phone. And that's something that I use from the inception of my practice. I never subscribe to a landline. I just don't see the point now that we have, you know, voice over internet phones. Tell me, you talked about growth and scaling. What are your goals when it comes to growth? Is it more sales, more offices, more practice areas? What are you, what's your mindset around growth? So this year we've expanded into business immigration and really the big goals are to help as many people as we possibly can. Ideally, you know, my long-term goals is to definitely have an office um, in multiple states um, so that I'm able to utilize these licenses for something. But primarily, I would like the, the business immigration side to focus on people within my own community, um, within the Arab community. And then the business side of things, you know, essentially just continuing to grow at the pace that we are. Last year, we grew 89%. This year, we're along the same lines. So it's, it's really exciting to, to move forward in that, in that perspective. But I am thinking about, you know, that balance. And, you know, at what point do I want to essentially focus more on my personal life than it is business? So it is, it's a little bit more difficult to manage and, and to, to think about, um, especially as a woman, you know, we have different variables we have to think about, if, especially if you want to you know, move on in our next phase and our next chapter of our lives of becoming wives and having children and so forth. All right, Selma, we do need to wrap things up. Before I do, I want to remind everyone to go to the Facebook group, get involved there. There's a lot of just great information every single day. I posted a couple of times yesterday and, and got a lot of responses. And so it's just a great environment to get feedback on things. Um, also, if you're interested in the Guild, check us out at MaximumLawyer.com. Uh, where we have more information on the guild. Jimmy, what is your hack of the week? All right, for my hack of the week, I have a four-day project. It's going to take 15 minutes each day. I want everyone to get out a pen and a piece of paper. Divide the piece of paper into four boxes. On the bottom right-hand corner, write 10-year goals. In the, the bottom left-hand corner, write five-year goals. In the upper right-hand corner, write one-year goals. And in the upper left-hand corner, write 90-day goals. And I want you to spend... 15 minutes today working on your 10 year goals. What do I, and ask yourself, what do I want? What do I want for my 10 year goals? And then, and then the next day you're going to work on your five year goals, then your one year goal, then your 90 day goals. That's it. It doesn't cost a dime. I like it. That's good. That's a good one. That's, I think it's a easy, uh, simple way of doing things, a, a easy way to get started because I think that a lot of people struggle with that. So I like it. Sounds like a coach thing. Did you get it from strategic coach? 
and traction. Yep. Nice. Nice. Okay, cool. All right, Selma. So we all, we always ask our guests to give a tip or hack of the week. It could be a book. It could be a podcast. It could be anything. Do you have a tip or a hack for us? Yeah. Um, so recently I've been reading the book Principles by Ray Dalio, and it is an amazing book where he discusses his life's principles and the principles that he has for his business. So I would highly recommend it. We just uh, discussed the uh, principles in the, in the guild yesterday. I also have a, a, a book as my tip and it's the hundred page book by Mike Capuzzi. It's an easy read. It takes about an hour. It's a really easy one, but he really, he talks about the importance of books, but he talks about an easy ways of doing books. I like his idea of making it very simple and, and all that. And I think that that's a good way to get started. I hate that he uses the term shooks instead of books. He calls them short, helpful books. He calls them shooks and it's so annoying throughout the book. But other than that, it's actually a really good system if you want to get started with the books. And the kind of way I'm looking at it is I think you could take, use his system to create three books, 300 page books, three books, and then put them together and just have them like three diff- different sections in a book. But he does give you, it's a very easy way of getting started. And that's what I like about it. So if you're thinking about getting a book or writing a book, read the hundred page book. And thanks to Larry Weinstein turning me on to it because it's, it's actually pretty good. So Alma, thanks so much for coming on. We really appreciate it. It's been a great podcast. So thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Have a great one. We'll see you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Maximum Lawyer Podcast. Maximum Lawyer Podcast. To stay in contact with your host and to access more content, more content. go to MaximumLawyer.com. Maximum Have a great week and catch you next time.